All right, we're back with uh, part two of our conversation with uh, Lloyd Meyer of the Notre Dame Law School, uh, who, as we mentioned in part one, uh, researches, writes about nonprofit law, and many other things. Uh, and we were talking about the concerns on the part of many, including cross ideologically, which is where I'll start, Professor, uh, about, can I say, oligarchs, uh, well, very wealthy people's use of uh, the nonprofit legal structure to uh, contribute to public discourse and affect the policy making of America. Uh, how about that? Could there be a potential future alliance or significant overlap between progressive critiques? of this use uh, uh, and what I'll call, I guess, for lack of a better term, populist conservative critiques. Most of this money we think at the Giving Review and, and, and where I work, where we try to track it is, you know, the big money is become is more liberal uh, and, and kind of progressive. Uh, so one could see, couldn't one more cross ideological overlap in this area? You certainly could. Um, and, and part one, we me you mentioned the rules for private foundations. Private foundations a little over 50 years ago were in the crosshairs of exactly that sort of alliance of concerns <clears throat> um, that wealthy individuals, oligarchs, through primarily private foundations were influencing politics, among other things, and doing other things that were of concern to Congress. And that led eventually to much tighter restrictions on private foundations in terms of what they can do, particularly when it comes to politics, tighter than charities generally face under the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so we could see that again. Um, one thing to note, though, is, of course, we're talking about charities. If you're a wealthy individual or even a group of wealthy individuals seeking to influence government policy and maybe public views, uh, you're not limited to charities. Uh, most uh, wealthy individuals have a constellation of entities that they consider using. And there might be a charity, there might be a private foundation, it could be a donor advice fund, but also it could be a so-called social welfare group or trade association that has less restrictions on political activity, less benefits. You don't get a deduction generally for giving to those groups, but you can use those. So the Koch brothers are famous for having a network of groups like that that they used, uh, but it's, all, it's not limited to people on one side of the ideological uh, divide. Um, and you can use for-profit entities. Uh, the Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, uh, Priscilla Chan, they have the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is not even a nonprofit. It's a limited liability company, which then funds nonprofits, including some charities, but it's really just an extension of themselves individually, just with organizing their you know, writ large philanthropic activities. Um, and it's not subject to any of the tax rules because it's not a separate entity really from them for tax purposes. So when a rich person, very mega, whatever, oligarch, d decides to LLC eyes his, her, their philanthropy, uh, that gets rid of the subsidization. You know, I, no one can say you're forcing me to agree with what you say through the indirect uh, flow of money intake. Well, that wouldn't be the end of the world, would it? If, if philanthropy on the part of uh, people with a viewpoint who have a lot of money it, takes that legal form of the essentially i guess if there's a cross ideological agreement that this is a problem that would lead to more llcization would that be bad i don't think this has to be bad it doesn't lead to, again to the larger debate over yeah. is at some point are people just have too much money right and have too much influence as a result of having too much money and that's obviously a much much bigger issue than this and so related debate that we're seeing, especially like um, Mackenzie Scott's giving has sort of triggered this, which is, well, if it's your money, however you obtained it, uh, and you're giving it away through whatever vehicles you're legally allowed to do so, do you have any obligation to sort of be transparent or accountable about how you're choosing the recipients, what exactly you're doing, or can you do it as sort of black box as you want? Um, and there's actually a huge debate, not just in the US, but, but globally now about that issue. You know? And again, this is about, you know, it's no one's saying you can't run your own business or invest in your business or do your business in any legal enterprise. But these are people that are seeking to do something broader than economic activity. Right? These are people that are seeking to shape society to some extent uh, by choosing who they fund, by setting education priorities or uh, racial justice priorities, uh, law enforcement priorities, et cetera. Um, and again, there's this uneasiness that if anyone has too much money and by spending a couple of billion dollars, they can really sort of move the dialogue on a particular issue. 
we feel a little uncomfortable about that because just because you made multi-billion dollars in business doesn't mean you know anything about education policy or policing policy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and why do you get more of a say than me, the average voter in the street and the average taxpayer? Mm -hmm. You have written, Professor, about, I think the, 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 this was in the subtitle, uh, if not also the text, Taming the Wild West. That's a quote of, of nonprofit political involvement. So how would you, is it tameable and how would you do it? So the, so the two big points I would make is first, I don't think it's the tax code or the IRS's job to tame the political wild west and nonprofit involvement. There are some principles that flow from the tax rules. Like you don't get, don't get a deduction, as I mentioned in part one, for, for your lobbying or political activity individually or as a business. So you should be able to do it by rooting the money through a charity or trade association. So those rules make sense, and Congress has put those rules in place. But beyond that, it's really not the IRS's job, and they're really not well suited. And in fact, it's come back and bit and bit in them in the Tea Party uh, controversy that erupted a while back um, to really try to control nonprofits' political involvement beyond those tax rules. That really is something that Congress and the states need to think about doing through their election laws and election administration. So that what I propose in that article is, look, if you're concerned about influence of individuals on politics and you want more transparency, you want more disclosure, maybe you want some spending limits to the degree the, the constitution allows that, um, do that through the election laws and have the agency that ministers that be the Federal Election Commission or its state counterparts, don't put the IRS in that position. That They're not well suited to that. They don't have the resources, frankly, to do that because most of their job is actually getting, you know, collecting the amount of taxes that are owed by people. And they're not doing a great job at that right now partly because Congress hasn't fully funded them, to be fair. Mm -hmm. um, that's really not their job to regulate politics. If you want to regulate politics, if you're concerned about like dark, so-called dark money or things like that, do it through the election laws, do it through the election agencies and have it triggered based on activity. So it doesn't matter whether you do it through a charity, some other kind of nonprofit, you do it individually through your business. The activity is what triggers the rules, the, the limits on giving, the disclosure requirements and so forth, have the activity trigger it and then it doesn't matter whether it's a charity or a nonprofit or anything like that. Uh, and again, it's not really a nonprofit problem. It's not really a tax problem. It's now an election law problem. Yeah. So doing that, I keep wanting to bring it back to the subsidization, uh, but not all the money flowing in politics is quote unquote subsidy. I mean, if, if subsidy is the problem, you do have to limit it. And the, and, the, the, and the tax law does that. I mean, yeah. I, I think, yeah, the tax law should do that. So the tax law says if your charity going to do so much lobbying, not too much, because we don't allow people to you know, be subsidized in the lobby. And you can't do any political campaign event. You can't support or oppose candidates in any way. And yet there's some you know, leaks in that prohibition, partly because of IRS lack of enforcement, but they're not huge because there are PR ramifications and other ramifications, not just tax ramifications, if you start you know, using a charity to support or oppose candidates. You know, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for the candidate, frankly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of charities want to stay out of that. Anyhow, and the tax rules are actually convenient for them. They can say to someone, some big donor that says, oh, I want you to, you know, really get involved in politics. Well, I can't. Tax law says I can't, yeah. right? And it gives them, a, 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 you know, a way of saying no. A lot of churches actually like this. We always hear about churches involved in politics, but a lot of churches don't want to be involved. Why? Because they've got Democrats and Republicans in the views. Yeah. They don't yeah. want to get caught up in partisan politics because then they're, 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 they're alienating part of their congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Your article, the same one that, uh, you know, I, I referenced and essentially I think we've been talking about, expresses a little bit of a fear of policy overreaction. Uh, and I guess that's what you were just describing. The overreaction would be to, one of them. The, the top of the list one would be to shove it all into the IRS's uh, uh, bailiwick uh not even again, that's where it is now. But uh, what would other overreactions be in what I've sketched out as a hypothetical uh, recognized overlap between progressives and populists? Uh, you know, you're when you're before the committee next Congress uh, talking about uh, how to solve this problem, what would you recommend they don't do to overreact? So, so one of the problems is outside the charitable way, but other types of nonprofits, right? There's this common criticism, right? That they, these are vehicles for quote, dark money. Because you don't know who the donors are and they're engaging in politics. They don't trigger the election law disclosure rules. And this is a nonprofit problem. I say, it's not a nonprofit problem because outside the charities, you really don't have much of a subsidy of anything uh, for these entities. Uh, so you're not breaking the tax rules by having them engaged in politics. If 
you know, the NRA or the Sierra Club, which are not charities, but are nonprofits, want to lobby unlimited, I say, let them lobby unlimited. If they want to endorse candidates, let them endorse candidates. Uh, because there's no subsidy involved. And the IRS shouldn't have to police that. And what the Tea Party, I mean, the Tea Party controversy arose because the IRS felt it had this need to limit the political activity of C4s. And they worried about people like, you know, creating stealth political entities through the C4 category, the social welfare organizations, which are not charities. Um, and my view is, let social welfare organizations be used for political activity because you don't have the subsidy activity. Now, again, if you want to limit that activity, you want to force disclosure, you're concerned about dark money, that should be a matter of election law. It should not be a matter of the tax laws. It should not be a matter of the IRS. And the Tea Party controversy shows the mess the IRS can get into if they try to police that. Because again, they don't do it well, right? It's not what they're set up to do. It's not what their employees are trained to do. It's not what the IRS commissioner's job is, really. The IRS commissioner's job is to make sure the federal government collects the right amount of tax. For tax exempt entities, there is no tax. Uh, it's really sort of a you know, a side venture of the IRS. It can be argued that the, the whole regulatory structure for taxes and nonprofits shouldn't even be in the IRS. It should be in some sort of separate agency, like in Australia, they have it in a non-tax government agency or some sort of self-regulatory body like we have for securities dealers. Mm -hmm. um, something, you know, because it really isn't the IRS's strength to mm -hmm. do that area. Um, but uh, that, yeah, I am concerned about overreach, about yeah. trying to use the tax code to go after dark money when really that's not what it's designed to do. Two more questions, Professor. The first is uh, different but related. And I keep dragging you back into the uh, more narrow uh, issue. But given the fly-by-night nature of, uh, you know, what are sometimes called pop-up groups in the, in the C3 or C4 context, I guess. But uh, isn't all money dark money now? You know, you got to wait three years to read the form and transparency, transparency, sh you know. All money is dark now, isn't it? Um, all money is dark, except if the election law provisions kick in, yeah. including some election law disclosure rules that have been imported into the tax code for so-called 527s, which are, are nonprofit political groups, you know, the wholly political, the, the, whole, the whole purpose is support of opposed candidates. For those entities, it's the disclosures aren't, you know, a year or two years later. The disclosures are actually almost in real time, especially as elections are close. You have to file regular reports. And as under election laws, as you get close to elections, more frequent reports that list all your major donors. Um, so those disclosures are much more real time for exactly the reason you pointed out, because you know you learn that so-and-so paid for an ad a year and a half later, no one cares, right? It's too late. The elections happened, no one cares. But if you learn that so-and-so paid for an ad you know, a week before the election, and that makes the newspapers, now you know something about the candidate that's supporting or opposing them. This person likes them or doesn't like them, uh, which hopefully you know informs voters. That's part of the reason for those disclosures. But they are much more real time. But it's all it's primarily through the election law. There's a there's a parallel IRS managed system. But again, it's not managed as well because the IRS isn't really set up for this. Yeah. Um, for 527, so that information is out there. Reporters can access it. The public can access searchable databases. All of that. So yeah. there is a way to counter dark money. And this model shows how you can, you know who gave to a candidate. That's all publicly reported. You know who gave to political parties. That's all publicly reported. And again, in real time, you know before the election, you know, who gave to Joe Biden's campaign or Donald Trump's campaign or whoever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's doable, but not really through the Internal Revenue Code and not really through the IRS, which in for 527s gets the filings, but doesn't do anywhere near as good job as the FEC does in making sure they're actually accurate and complete and so forth. Mm -hmm. The final question then, uh, what are you working on next, Professor? Um, so I'm working on a piece actually relating to uh, tax exemption, nonprofits, and speech. Uh, there's been a lot of concern recently about, well, we've discovered these white supremacists and these hate groups are charities. You know, how could that be the case? Um, the group that promotes uh, the horse dewormer medication for COVID is actually a charity. Um, and there's, all, there's groups out there, there's Holocaust denial groups, there's 9-11 uh, conspiracy groups that are all charities. It's like, well, how can this be? Um, and it turns out it's because we let, you know, charities be formed for anything that's vaguely public benefiting. So in the eye of the beholder, anything that's vaguely educational. Um, and if you're going to go after groups that you disagree with or you think are wrong, or maybe everyone thinks is wrong or just about everyone, uh, you, it's hard to do that under the First Amendment without throwing out a lot of other groups, which are you know, giving what most people would say are, are positive contributions 
to national dialogue. So I'm looking at that issue and, and that hard problem. Um, I'm also looking at the legal definition of charitable more broadly and whether there's anything in the natural law concept of basic goods, which might help us better refine or understand why we have such a broad and vague definition of charitable, why we let many flowers bloom. Is there really a principled support for that, especially given the subsidies that charities receive? Yeah. Well, gosh, uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Meyer of the Notre Dame Law School for joining us briefly here. We look forward to uh, consuming your work product, including the two you mentioned, uh, among others. Uh, so thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me.